late at night in the streets of Oriudong, a neighborhood in Seoul, we hear people screaming for help as they meet a brutal end at the hands of an unknown creature. Amidst this chaos, a small group of survivors, trembling in fear, watch as the creature grabs a helpless crying baby. The monstrous being looks like something out of a post-apocalyptic manhua, shocking all the survivors, including the baby's mother who screams for someone to help save her child. However, everyone is frozen in fear. The police who arrived have been killed, leaving them praying for a miracle, knowing there's no way to escape. Fortunately, a miracle does occur. Just as the creature is about to harm the baby, a mysterious figure moves at lightning speed, saving the baby just in time by cutting off one of the creature's hands. The monster, enraged, turns to face the masked figure, a muscular teenager wearing casual clothes and a backwards cap, with blonde hair hidden under a black mask over his eyes. Seeing this, the monster releases the baby and charges aggressively at the masked figure, intending to take his life. Meanwhile, the baby lands safely in its mother's arms as the masked figure and the creature engage in a fierce battle. The monster attacks relentlessly, but the masked figure dodges and delivers powerful blows, eventually sending the creature crashing into a building. Despite its injuries, the monster charges again, only to be met with another punishing attack from the masked figure, ultimately ending its life. Now, it was no ordinary feat to defeat such a monster that had earlier managed to kill dozens of armed police officers. The sight of this masked figure's accomplishment left the surviving onlookers in awe, their mouths agape, and soon they began clapping in pure admiration. Witnessing this, the masked figure didn't seem pleased by the praise and simply turned to leave. However, he was halted by the mother of the saved baby boy, expressing profound gratitude and the hope of repaying the favor someday. Upon hearing her words, the masked figure merely gave the young mother a glance before swiftly leaping several feet onto the tall buildings surrounding the street, making his daring escape. As he bounded from one building to another at astonishing speed, the astonished onlookers realized that superhumans truly existed in their world. The following day, inside a classroom at Seo Yun High School, a teacher lectures about natural disasters to the students. At the back of the room sit the set eights, two teenagers who are clearly disinterested in the lesson, engrossed instead in watching a video on their phones. It's the latest, and up-close footage of the white-capped superhero in action in Oru Dong. So the two teens, being avid fans of the white-capped superhero, are thrilled to witness the action so intimately, albeit from the comfort of their seats. As they are immersed in the battle between the white-capped superhero and the alien-like monster, pondering where such creatures emerge from, they fail to notice their teacher observing them closely. The teacher, noticing the distraction of the two students at the back, is about to reprimand them when the school alarm suddenly blares, signaling a disaster alert. This startles all the students except for one, a blonde teenage boy who is sound asleep. As all the students began packing their bags, the principal's voice came through the classroom speaker, announcing that the alert was issued by the Inhuman Alert System due to a potential sighting of an Inhuman nearby. Consequently, all classes were cancelled for the day, and both students and faculty were urged to evacuate the school and return home promptly. Upon hearing this, the students, now in a state of semi-panic, prepared to leave. However, before they could do so, their homeroom teacher intervened, urging them to maintain order and to ensure a careful departure. So following the teacher's instructions, each student left the classroom in an orderly fashion. Amidst this, one female student continued to pack her belongings, lost in thoughts about the increasingly frequent appearances of inhumans. And this marked the third of such incident this year alone. She couldn't shake the memory of a tragic event from a few years ago when an inhuman emerged, resulting in the deaths of approximately 70 people and the destruction of an entire city. Recognizing the grave threat posed by these creatures, she knew that if their appearances weren't stopped, and another catastrophic event like the one in the past occurred, the consequences would be dire. After finishing packing her belongings, she prepared to leave the classroom when she noticed one of her classmates, the blonde-haired student, still sound asleep. Surprised, she attempted to wake him up, but just as she was about to, he woke up himself in response to a call on his phone. Checking the caller ID, he saw it was his best friend, Yo Ri. So without hesitation, the blonde student, named Lim Kang, answered the call, asking where to head to. Yo Ri quickly replied, indicating Inchun port and providing exact coordinates, while also reminding Kang not to forget his earpiece. Upon hearing this, Kang immediately agreed before ending the call, and he turned to find one of his female classmates staring at him, slightly startled. Kang inquired why she was staring, and she informed him about the alert, urging him to go home quickly. Unfazed, Kang let out a loud yawn, leaving the girl puzzled by his carefree demeanor. Nonetheless, she left, knowing that such recklessness could lead to Kang getting killed sooner or later. Meanwhile, Kang, after ensuring he had all his equipment, 
casually checked his surroundings in the now empty classroom before inconspicuously heading to the bathroom. Now, at Incheon Seaport, we witness Truck Kun speeding towards the monster, ready to isekai its ass, only to find that as it crashes into the monster at near cosmic level speed, its force is significantly reduced by 99.9% .9 to protect the human inside, resulting in minimal damage to the monster. Unmoved by this, the Inhuman proceeds to destroy both the Truck Kun and the driver, killing them instantly. Amidst the chaos at the port, a worker hides a few feet away, trembling in fear as he witnesses the brutal display of the beast. His companion, Jay Gu, stands beside him, unable to contain his tears, knowing they cannot escape, and that their death was inevitable. However, the man tries to remain optimistic, reassuring Jay Gu that help will come soon and urging him to stay silent to avoid attracting the monster. He explains that as long as they stay strong and survive, they will be rescued. Hearing this, Jay Gu manages to calm down and stop crying. But unfortunately, it's too late, as the noise has already alerted the monster, which suddenly appears before them, shocking Jay Gu into silence. The other man, unaware of the situation, continues to search for the monster, oblivious to its presence few inches above them. Still at Seo Yun High School, we listen in as Yo Ri communicates with Kang via their communication devices, asking Kang about his current location, and Kang responds, explaining that he is in the process of changing in the bathroom. Upon hearing this, Yo Ri becomes anxious, aware of the dangerous situation unfolding at Incheon Seaport. So, he promptly urges Kang to hurry so he can provide directions to the precise location Kang needs to reach. Responding to Yo Ri's urgency, Kang swiftly changes into his white cap superhero costume and informs Yo Ri that he is ready. Recognizing Kang's tendency towards clumsiness, Yo Ri takes a moment to confirm a few details, asking if Kang has his earphones on and if his bag and school uniform are securely hidden. Kang confirms these details, and with everything in order, Yo Ri instructs Kang to follow his directions and run in the designated direction. Kang agrees, and with a leap through a nearby window, he begins moving at lightning speed in the direction indicated by Yo Ri. Back at the seaport, both Jay Gu and his previously unaware companion finally notice the monstrous presence above them. Their faces fill with shock as they stare at it. But unfortunately, before Jay Gu's companion can react, he is swiftly smashed headfirst into the containers behind him, resulting in instant death. Meanwhile, Jay Gu, already in a frantic attempt to escape, finds himself unable to create enough distance between himself and the monster. The creature leaps towards him, landing behind Jay Gu, who freezes in fear. Slowly, the monster places its hands on Jay Gu's head, preparing to crush it, leaving Jay Gu pleading for mercy and disbelief. However, instead of finishing him off immediately, the monster casually tosses him towards a nearby container with great force, causing multiple bones to shatter and likely resulting in punctured lungs. Despite the excruciating pain, Jay Gu manages to rise to his knees, blood dripping from his mouth and nose. But before he can fully process the agony he's enduring, Jay Gu notices the looming shadow of the monster behind him, and everything seems to go numb. With dread sinking in, Jay Gu turns to face the monster, feeling a sense of terror as he realizes his impending death. However, just as he anticipates his demise, a spanner from somewhere in the port suddenly flies towards the monster striking it at the back of its head and diverting its attention momentarily from the injured Jay Gu. As the monster turns around to confront the source of the interference, it sees an elderly looking man, who turns out to be Jay Gu's boss. On the contrary, Kang continued to speed toward the port at a frightening pace, while Yo Ri relayed that the Inhuman Subjugation Special Task Force was already en route to the location. However, before Yo Ri could finish his sentence, Kang had already arrived close enough to see the port with his own eyes. Meanwhile, back at the port, the monster maintained its menacing stare at Jay Gu's boss while the latter attempted to reason with Jay Gu, urging him to save himself while the monster was distracted. However, Jay Gu was so overwhelmed by fear that he couldn't fully comprehend his boss's words. Witnessing Jay Gu's paralyzed state, his boss couldn't help but grimace in frustration, realizing that he could have saved himself if he hadn't attempted to draw the monster's attention in an effort to save Jay Gu. With Jay Gu unable to respond and the monster now focused on them both, he knew that they were both going to get dipped unless a miracle occurred. Tears welled in his eyes as he thought of his daughter Dong Gu and his wife, accepting his fate and hoping they would forgive him for leaving them so early. As predicted, the monster approached a nearby container and hurled it at Jay Gu's boss with full force. But just as the container was about to strike him, a figure suddenly appeared beside him, kicking the container away, much to his astonishment. It was Kang, arriving just in the nick of time to rescue the men. And now facing the inhuman, Kang prepared himself for battle. Through the communication device, we hear Yo Ri expressing his nervousness about the impending battle, while Kang remains entirely focused on the inhuman, 
their gazes locked as if they shared some familiarity. Breaking the silence, Kang suggests to Yo Ri the idea of attempting to communicate with the monster. In a close-up view of Kang's cap, we notice a mini camera attached to it, allowing Yo Ri to monitor the situation from a safe location. Upon hearing Kang's suggestion and recognizing that it was worth a try, despite the slim chances of success, Yo Ri agrees. This plan had been pre-arranged, as both Kang and Yo Ri had agreed that before engaging in combat with an inhuman, Kang should first attempt to communicate with them to understand their motives and origins. With this in mind, Kang initiates communication with the monster, asking if it can speak and comprehend his words. Surprisingly, the monster responds with murmurs that suggest understanding, although it's incomprehensible. Moments later, the monster suddenly becomes enraged and charges at Kang. Kang manages to dodge the attack easily, but is caught off guard by a second strike, which he blocks, but the force sends him crashing into a wall. Fortunately, the attack inflicts minimal harm to Kang, and he lands safely on the ground. Yo Ri, monitoring the situation and growing increasingly worried, asks Kang how he is faring, to which Kang simply replies that the monster is much faster than anticipated. Concerned, Yo Ri taps to his head in frustration, urging Kang to be sure to exercise caution. As the events unfolded, a helicopter belonging to the LDS news station swiftly appeared above the port, seemingly broadcasting the entire situation, including the confrontation between Kang and the Inhuman, as well as the sudden arrival of the Inhuman Subjugation Special Task Force. The captain of the Special Task Force, observing the scenario, instructs his men not to engage in gunfire. Upon hearing this, one of his men informs him that the port is too narrow for tanks and railguns to enter. But despite this setback, the captain urges him not to worry and to keep everyone on standby. However, the young man by his side couldn't help but question how they would execute their plan without their arsenal. In response, the captain simplifies the situation, explaining that based on intelligence analyzes, the power of the white-capped individual exceeds standard military firepower, as does that of the Inhumans. So essentially, if the white cap loses, they were all fucked. Upon hearing this, this sergeant was visibly shaken, expressing his confusion, and by putting two and two together, he questioning the reason for their presence there then. In response, the captain, with a stern expression, reassured him not to worry and informed him that even the military has a contingency plan in case things didn't go as expected. Meanwhile, in Ichon, tension filled the air as everyone watched the broadcasted battle between White Cap and the Inhuman. Throughout the fight, White Cap had been primarily on the defensive, waiting for the opportune moment to strike. As the battle unfolded, White Cap attempted to maneuver and evade the attacks of the Inhuman. However, a sudden, terrifyingly fast attack from the Inhuman momentarily caught him off guard. But despite this, White Cap managed to evade the attack, creating an opening for himself. In mid-air, he lunged towards the monster, aiming a powerful blow at its head. However, in response to his descent, the monster unexpectedly unleashed its massive tongue, knocking White Cap off balance. And before he could recover, the monster grabbed White Cap's leg and forcefully slammed him through one of the containers. This turn of events left Yori, who was watching the battle, deeply concerned, and the onlookers shocked, many of whom had already believed that White Cap had lost the battle. However, just before they could get dipped by the monster, the Subjugation Special Task Force's backup plan, a half-human, half-cyborg member, leapt out of the van and immediately unleashed a devastating blast from his weapon. The blast pierced through the monster's head, rendering it unconscious, much to the shock of everyone present. However, their momentary triumph was short-lived as the monster regained consciousness, now even more enraged than before, seemingly unaffected by the attack. Witnessing this unexpected turn of events, everyone was stunned. Yet, the cyborg wasn't done cooking yet. Without hesitation, he continued to unleash a barrage of shots at the monster. However, despite his relentless assault, the monster showed no signs of slowing down, steadily advancing towards them. Nevertheless, the cyborg remained resolute, prepared to continue firing until he depleted his ammunition or armor. However, at that crucial moment, both the cyborg and the inhuman paused, noticing movement emerging from a dent in one of the containers. To their surprise, it was Kang, who had sustained little to no damage from the previous attack. In fact, he was relieved to have been thrown towards something solid, knowing that otherwise, he might have ended up in the sea, drenching his superhero costume. Observing Kang's well-being, Yo Ri breathed a sigh of relief, remarking that it seemed the monster either lacked the ability to communicate or chose not to, but either way, Bro was about to get cooked and dipped. So with this realization in mind, Kang advanced towards the monster, and in a blur of motion, he vanished before reappearing above the creature, delivering a powerful kick to its skull. Then, 
He follows up by thrusting his fist into the monster's mouth, right before pulling it and sending it crashing to the ground at super speed. The impact created a miniature earthquake, shaking the entire port and momentarily throwing the hovering helicopter off balance. Fortunately, this devastating attack left the monster incapacitated, shocking everyone present, including the viewers watching the live broadcast. However, the Inhuman was not yet defeated. Despite the damage it had sustained, it began to rise slowly. Yet, due to the severity of its injuries, it eventually collapsed lifeless to the ground, relieving the tension that had gripped the area. Observing the scene, Yo Ri couldn't help but breathe a sigh of relief, though he still needed confirmation from Kang regarding the Inhuman's demise. Kang assured him, explaining that he had sensed the monster's brain exploding upon the impact of the final strike. Even if the monster were to rise again, Kang was confident he could defeat it, as it wasn't as powerful as a certain inhuman he had encountered on Anmayan Island. Hearing this, Yo Ri's frustration was evident, realizing that Kang had indeed faced difficulties against that particular inhuman. Meanwhile, from a vantage point above the battle scene at the port, a mysterious looking man adorned with intricate tattoos reminiscent of Sukuna appeared to be simply enjoying the spectacle. However, what truly excited him was the sheer ruthlessness displayed by White Cap, knowing full well that it wasn't even a demonstration of his full strength. With this in mind, he turned to his companion, a mysterious woman named Dan Yang, and informed her that he would be back shortly. In a split second, he leapt down, appearing behind Kang. Startled by the sound, Kang turned around to identify the newcomer, and facing him was a tall, muscular man with a wild appearance adorned with tattoos. Watching through the mini-camera, Yo Ri couldn't help but anxiously ponder the identity of the mysterious figure. Meanwhile, Kang wasted no time in asking for the newcomer's identity. With a smile, the stranger complimented Kang's intense gaze. As the mysterious figure approached Kang, Kang glanced upward, noticing another enigmatic individual, the woman named Dan Yang, also observing the scene. Observing this, Yo Ri grew increasingly tense, while the news broadcast speculated that another confrontation was imminent. In contrast, the commander of the special task force analyzed the situation calmly, while his subordinate, visibly on edge, questioned the commander about the current circumstances, to which the commander admitted his uncertainty. With the sudden appearance of this new element, the previously subdued tension in the air heightened, with everyone on high alert in case a significant battle ensued. Returning to the interaction between Kang and the mysterious figure, the latter couldn't resist complimenting Kang on his impressive performance in the fight, likening it to that of Ketchup Man, the protagonist of the renowned TV show The Unyielding Ketchup Man. Upon hearing this compliment, Kang's eyes widened in shock. It turned out he was a devoted fan of Ketchup Man, so being compared to his idol left him pleasantly surprised. Curious, Kang couldn't help but inquire which aspects of him were reminiscent of Ketchup Man. Meanwhile, Yo Ri, noticing Kang's flattered reaction and being aware of Kang's weakness for compliments, especially when they involved his idol, urged Kang to compose himself and focus on obtaining the identity and origin of the mysterious figure. Upon hearing this, Kang abruptly snapped out of his daze and began firing questions at the mysterious figure, albeit incoherently, much to Yo Ri's frustration. It was evident that Kang was still scatterbrained from the compliment. Yo Ri was uneasy with the current situation, sensing the potential danger posed by the man facing Kang, but he felt powerless to intervene. Meanwhile, the mysterious figure reassured Kang not to be wary, mentioning how he had been following Kang's appearances on TV broadcasts, social media, and streams. However, he clarified that his presence here wasn't solely because of Kang, as he had another purpose, and observing the fight was merely an added bonus. In response, Kang questioned why he should trust the mysterious figure's words. Through the communication system, Yo Ri relayed to Kang a similar incident where they encountered strange individuals who turned out to be government agents, initially attacking Kang with tasers. There was a possibility that the person in front of them could be a government agent or military personnel. Consequently, they couldn't afford to take such risks, and in conclusion, Yo Ri urged Kang to leave the area as soon as possible. Upon hearing this, Kang remained silent, maintaining a deep glare at the mysterious figure, who couldn't help but chuckle at the situation's absurdity. Nevertheless, he decided to share something intriguing with Kang and asked if he knew how the material world referred to him. Kang responded that they called him a superhuman. At this revelation, the mysterious figure smirk grew slightly as he disclosed that he too was a superhuman, and there were others besides them, individuals defying logic and possessing strength beyond their wildest imaginations. This revelation was a game-changer for Kang and Yo Ri. They were both shocked by this astounding disclosure, and although Kang managed to remain composed, Yo Ri found himself sweating bullets. He had been vaguely aware that there were a few superhumans in the USA and Europe, 
but he hadn't anticipated the existence of more superhumans, especially another one apart from Kang, present in South Korea. At the same time, in the United States, a young man was monitoring the entire broadcast when he was suddenly interrupted by a tall, muscular woman named Pearl, who appeared to recognize one of the superhumans featured in the broadcast. Upon hearing this, the young man inquired if she was referring to the white-capped superhuman, but Pearl corrected him, explaining that she meant the other superhuman with tattoos. In the small office, another individual with a formidable appearance was also present, and Pearl, still engrossed in the ongoing situation, asked the young man monitoring the broadcast if there was a way they could eavesdrop on the conversation between White Cap and the mysterious braided individual. In response, the young man lamented that it was unfortunate that they couldn't, as he himself was curious about their conversation. Meanwhile, in Scotland, inside a local burger joint, everyone in the restaurant was fixated on the screen, watching the live broadcast. Suddenly, one of the patrons, a middle-aged African-American woman, was interrupted by her younger sister, who informed her that they were running late for a Justin Bieber show, for which she had secretly bought tickets for. Upon hearing this, the mysterious middle-aged woman snapped out of her trance, eliciting a slight joke and giggled towards her sister. In Moscow, two young men, one blonde whose name remained unknown, and the other with pink hair named Bashalov, were also tuned into the broadcast. While watching, the blonde man asked Mr. Bashalov if he knew the identity of the mysterious braided man, and Mr. Bashalov replied that he didn't, but based on intuition, he could tell that the man was also a superhuman. It's worth noting that only Kang and Yo-Ri had heard the mysterious figure reveal his status as a superhuman, as others couldn't hear the conversation and as a result remain unaware of his identity. The two young men were getting uneasy vibes from the braided mysterious figure, notably evidenced by Mr. Bashalov's discomfort, as he seemed to be squeezing his face like he was about to drop a fat shit. Back at Ichon Airport, Kang and the mysterious figure were still engaged in conversation. Kang expressed his disinterest in other superhumans and urged the mysterious figure to stop stalking him. And with that, Kang began to walk away, visibly hungry after the previous battle. The mysterious figure couldn't help but giggle sadly, disappointed that Kang was leaving before he could finish what he wanted to say. However, he saw no issue in visiting Kang at school to continue their conversation. This proposition sent shivers down Kang's spine, as nobody knew his identity, not even that he was a student. Yo Ri was also shocked by this revelation. But before they could react, the mysterious masked figure promised not to reveal their secret and even urged Kang to relay the message to the pink headed guy, Yo Ri, who was listening in on their conversation through the earpiece. This revelation left Kang and Yo Ri fully on edge and shocked, as the mysterious figure not only knew Kang's identity but also Yo Ri's. The mysterious man continued, revealing that he knew everything about Kang's secret helper, Yo Ri, a genius who created everything Kang used, from his mask to the ultra small hidden camera. As a result, he sometimes had to resist the urge to kidnap Yo Ri. He then proceeded to threaten Kang, suggesting that he might have to play with his little friend while he was at school, leaving Yo Ri sweating bullets. Kang, boiling with rage, was suddenly surrounded by a mysterious aura. He wasn't ready to put Yo Ri's life, his only family, in danger. Even if he had to confront the mysterious figure to the death, he was prepared. Upon hearing this, the mysterious figure tried to explain that he wasn't Kang's enemy, but Kang wasn't buying it. Seeing there was no choice, the mysterious figure began radiating a gloomy aura, preparing himself for battle. Upon witnessing this, Kang immediately lunged forward with a punch, surprising everyone present. However, the mysterious figure skillfully and effortlessly blocked Kang's attack, leaving even Yo Ri shocked as it was the first time he had seen Kang's punch countered so easily. Undeterred, Kang swiftly transitioned into a backhand attack, but the mysterious figure pulled a gojo on him, effortlessly standing on Kang's hand as if it were nothing. Addressing Kang, the mysterious figure remarked that Kang had attacked him as though he intended to kill, yet he was still holding back. After delivering this statement, the mysterious figure gracefully leapt off Kang's hand and landed backwards. With a menacing smile, he challenged Kang to come at him with all his might if he desired to fight, warning that failure to do so would result in death. As he began radiating an immense aura, he emphasized that once they started, the entire place would be destroyed, as they wouldn't stop until everything was obliterated. Startled by this revelation, Kang was caught off guard. However, Yo Ri urged him to remain calm, explaining that the current situation wasn't about winning or losing, as they had nothing to gain from fighting. Although Yo Ri was bothered by the sudden revelation of their identities as superhumans and the mysterious figure's knowledge of them, he emphasized the need to de-escalate the situation. Moreover, the mysterious figure was a superhuman unlike any Kang had faced before, prompting the need for them to retreat and strategize. The mysterious figure, 
upon noticing Kang's sudden change in demeanor, realized that Kang had likely grasped the situation. Sensing that Kang no longer desired to fight, the figure prepared to depart. However, Kang halted him and insisted that he reveal his name before leaving. In response, the figure introduced himself as Nan Gi, and Kang reciprocated by introducing himself as Lim Kang. As Nan Gi began to walk away, his companion, Dan Yang, landed beside him, wearing a concerned expression. She requested to examine Nan Gi's hands, which he had used to block Kang's attack, but Nan Gi reassured her with a smile that it was nothing to worry about, and suggested they leave. As they walked away, a close-up view revealed Nan Gi's arms, which appeared severally bruised or even broken. Shortly afterward, Nan Gi and Dan Yang vanished into thin air, leaving everyone watching, including the mysterious individuals from the USA and Moscow, somewhat surprised by the seemingly anticlimactic conclusion of the encounter. Meanwhile, in Moscow, the blonde man was able to discern the reason behind the sudden end to the fight. He realized that if the altercation had continued, it would have posed a significant danger to everything and everyone present, potentially resulting in catastrophic destruction. However, unlike him, this abrupt conclusion left many people feeling frustrated and discontented. At the port, Kang was interrupted by the two men he had rescued earlier, Jay Gu and his boss. They were profoundly grateful to Kang for saving their lives, particularly Jay Gu's boss, who wished to express his gratitude by inviting Kang to lunch. However, Kang politely declined the offer before swiftly leaving the scene. Upon witnessing this, the special task force was instructed by their commander to promptly retrieve the Inhuman's body. Meanwhile, the cyborg, observing the ineffectiveness of the bullets he had fired at the monster, interjected and informed the commander that their current challenge in battling the Inhuman wasn't merely about the shape, weight, or composition of the bullets. He emphasized that until they acquired revolutionary technology to combat the Inhuman, their efforts would result in futile sacrifices. Understanding the gravity of the situation, the captain agreed to convey this message to the ISSTF researchers. However, as the cyborg departed, the captain received an urgent call from the commander of the special task force, Beko Jin. Beko Jin questioned why the captain hadn't reported back to him immediately after the situation had concluded, as ordered. Despite the captain's attempts to apologize, Beko Jin remained unsympathetic and stressed the importance of securing the Inhuman's corpse, emphasizing that it was the crucial aspect of their mission. Upon learning that progress was being made on transportation, Beko Jin instructed the captain that once the transportation was completed, their mission would be concluded, and they were to retreat back to the ISSTF. Upon hearing this, the captain clenched his teeth in frustration before affirming and ending the call. Meanwhile, Commander Beko Jin immediately dialed another number as soon as the call concluded. The recipient of the call questioned if it was urgent, to which Beko Jin explained that he needed to provide a report on the inhuman crisis, citing 14 fatalities and two critically injured individuals. However, before Beck could proceed with his report, the individual on the other end abruptly interrupted, expressing disinterest in the details and requesting a summary instead. Beko Jin complied with the request, informing the individual that the transport vehicle for the inhuman corpse would depart for the Falcon area soon. The individual then inquired about the arrival time, to which Beck responded that it was scheduled for the following night. During the call, the individual was interrupted by a guard, indicating that it was time for a certain event. So consequently, the individual abruptly ended the conversation with a stern warning to Beck not to waste his time with such trivial matters again. After concluding the call, the mysterious individual adjusted his tie in annoyance at the commander's report of casualties and expressed frustration at addressing what he referred to as dirty ass fucking ants, who are basically the people he was going upstage to address. However, he quickly composed himself and adopted a different demeanor as he made his way to a stage where people were chanting his name, Marcus. Just before making his entrance, the host introduced him as Marcus Gerald, hailed as the hope of the new generation and the harbinger of a peaceful and revolutionary future. Meanwhile, at Inchun Port, as the special task force unit prepared to transport the inhuman corpse, they loaded it onto a particular flying machine that promptly took off. Observing this, the sergeant alongside the captain inquired if the flying machine belonged to the Yishf, to which the captain negated, stating they didn't need to know anything about it. From a concealed vantage point, Nan Gi and Dan Yang observed the departure of the flying machine and confirmed that it was en route to Falcon. The scene then shifts, revealing Ketchup Man engaged in mid-air combat against an inhuman adversary. With remarkable ease, he executed his signature move, the unyielding Ketchup Fist, incapacitating the monster. Initially, he offered a line of mercy, suggesting the monster return and inform Charlotte that as long as he stood, Earth would not be threatened. However, he had a change of heart, opting instead to deliver a brutal beating to the inhuman in full view of civilians and news broadcasters. 
and following the onslaught, he shockingly proceeded to clap his fat cheeks in front of the camera. It turns out that what they were witnessing was just a TV show, with Kang completely engrossed in it while Yo Ri appeared to be loudly sleeping on the couch. Suddenly, Yo Ri woke up to find Kang wide awake, much to his surprise, and he questioned how Kang wasn't tired after the intense fight from the previous day. Kang explained that he had to watch the premiere of the new Ketchup Man series, which aired in the morning. With that, Kang started discussing the new series, but Yo Ri quickly shut him down, not wanting any spoilers, and lay back down. Meanwhile, Kang excitedly recalled the compliment he received from Nan Gi, comparing him to Ketchup Man. This irritated Yo Ri, who urged Kang to go to sleep. However, just then Yo Ri realized that Kang had school, catching him off guard. In response, he swiftly informs Kang who was in shock by this, as he proceeds to question why Yo Ri didn't inform him earlier, right before quickly heading to the room to change. Left in tears by the chaos Kang was causing, Yo Ri watched as Kang hurriedly prepared for school. Soon after, the scene changes, and we find Kang on his way to school, overhearing two fellow students discussing the battle between White Cap Man and Nan Gi. They were debating whether White Cap Man had the upper hand in the fight, with one student asserting that White Cap Man was the best because he was willing to risk his life to fight the Inhumans. The other student, however, dismissed White Cap Man as a hero, suggesting instead that he might be a government-created cyborg, which rubbed Kang the wrong way. As the students continued their banter, they accidentally bumped into a tall, muscular student named Choi Taek. Seeing the fear on the students' faces, they knew they were in trouble. Choi Taek threatened to teach them a lesson, but his anger escalated when he noticed Kang glaring at him from a few feet away. This prompted him to confront Kang, demanding that he stop glaring at him. Kang, maintaining an indifferent expression, apologized and tried to walk away, but Choi Taek wasn't willing to let him off the hook so easily. He approached Kang and threatened that if Kang ever looked at him like that again, he would gouge out his eyes. Despite Kang's unchanged expression, the two boys behind him were terrified, realizing that they had encountered a member of the Gundu gang. The Gundu gang originated from Ma Bong Middle School, spearheaded by its founder, Park Gundu. Renowned for targeting proficient fighters, Park Gundu and all members of the gang were notorious for possessing strength and skills far surpassing those of typical high schoolers. Unfortunately, they had just irked one of their own, not just any member but one of their kapos. This realization left both boys on edge, fearing not only for themselves but also for Kang, who had been threatened by Choi Taek. Nevertheless, they resolved not to dwell on the situation too much, opting instead to steer clear of anyone associated with the Gun Du gang altogether. At school, Hong, Kang's female classmate, is seen sitting with stitches on her cheeks, rudely awoken by Yo Jin Yo, a first-year student from class 8, who questions why she's dozing off so early in the morning. Yo's attention is immediately drawn to the stitches on Hong's face, expressing concern and reminding her that she had advised her to quit boxing. However, Hong dismisses her concern, but their conversation is interrupted when Kang walks by and takes a seat next to Hong. Suddenly, Kang is called by Yo, prompting him to turn around and inquire what she wants, to which she humorously points out that his fly is open. Both Kang and Hong's faces instantly light up at this revelation, and as Kang hurriedly tries to zip up his pants, Yo exits the scene. As she leaves, Hong remarks that she smells like cigarettes and advises her to stop hanging out with certain guys, but Yo brushes off her concerns, adding that she might reconsider if Hong quits boxing. Hong calls Yo an idiot in response, then turns to Kang, who is still struggling with his zipper, eliciting a small smile from her. Meanwhile, in the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean, a ship cruises along when one of the crew members notices something emerging from the sea's depths. What could it be? Well, for that, you'll just have to like, subscribe, and comment for a part 2 to find out.